I think the most difficult thing in doing Tron was to marry the computer simulation moments with the, with the live action photography and have them feel like they were all in the same place. The fact that we were shooting people in black and white costumes on sets that were black and matting those people into computer simulated worlds, that many of those backgrounds were you know, computer simulated uh, scenes and then you were putting people in them or you were putting computer simulated images into uh, uh, graphically created scenes and then matting people into that to have that all homogenized and feel like it was the same place so you didn't say oh that was done this way and this was done this way and also that the work done by Magi, Triple I, Abel's all married together and felt like one thing so you would say oh that was done by Magi and that was done by Triple I so that it just became a homogenized you know world that all m melted together as a design problem and as a as a filmmaking problem, I think that was the most difficult thing to do. But I, it was what I was most pleased with, that it did work so well. I noticed very early on in, in my work with computer simulation that all the different companies who did it basically had their own technique for doing it. It's like they each had their own kind of hot rod and, and their own kind of crew, and, uh, and they were all hybrid systems. And the most difficult thing was, you know, getting uh, them to have the same vocabulary, the same understanding, the same description of three space motion, the same description of a color. And, uh, but after looking at it for a, a while, I realized that there were similarities that everybody understood. And basically, it's everybody's understanding of three space, of, of dimensional choreography. How surfaces were rendered, you know, whether one company could make something shinier or smoother or more like chrome, uh, that's also basically when you get down to making a picture, a matter of art direction. When we started dealing with the computer companies on Tron, you have to remember that a lot of the people who develop software for computers are not really filmmakers. They didn't begin their career as filmmakers. And so they won't approach the creation of visual imagery in the same way that a filmmaker will. We went in not knowing anything about computer technology. We only knew what we wanted to achieve on the film. But with discussions with the development groups in each company, we were convinced that we could actually develop the technology as we went along and marry it with the creative needs and end up with a film that would look good. As an example, we wanted a feeling of vast scale in Tron. We wanted that cycle arena to feel like it was miles wide. When a computer creates a picture, it will create everything crystal clear. So something that's a mile away will actually appear as clear and distinct and as well lit as something that's a foot away. And that just doesn't look real. So we said, you know what we need? We need a feeling of atmosphere in these shots. We have to make it look like things that are far away are far away. And in real life, you do that by softening the focus and you know, kind of dimming the colors. And we came up with something that is really very simple, I think a standard technique now in computer graphics called depth cluing. You assign a mathematical progression uh, to, the, to the light of the points, depending on how far away they are from the camera source. The farther away they are, the less distinct they are, and that makes them look farther away. It's something you automatically get in live-action photography, but it's something that you have to mathematically apply to a computer image. Again, it was this constant give and take of uh, our visual requirements with their technical possibilities that uh, created Tron. When we finished Tron, uh, we had pushed the technology of these computer companies, I think, many, many years ahead of where they would have been if they hadn't worked with us during the feature. Once we'd finished the storyboard on a scene, we'd have to describe the scene in a a little more technical way, we'd have our blueprints and layouts of the actual objects, our blueprints of the models, of the, the tank or the recognizer, and our blueprints of the canyons. And then we'd supply whatever supplementary diagrams or pictures were needed so the programmers could understand what it was they were entering. Uh, this, as an example, is a diagram that we did for that shot of the recognizer flying out of the canyon, out of the garbage dump. We just kind of did an overall layout. Although you would never see this in the film, we want to describe to the programmer exactly what was going on. Because to the computer, the computer, this environment actually existed. So you can see the garbage dump here and the walls, and you can see the floor and the canyon, and how the canyon was related to this area. Although you would never see this area in the film. If you notice this little thing here, this is our camera, and this is where it would be placed in the beginning of the scene, shooting the recognizer. And as the recognizer flew out this direction and toward this canyon, the camera would turn and then follow the recognizer. So we drew a diagram for the Rico path and for the camera path. We did additional schematic diagrams, actual blueprint drawings on graph paper. 
But this kind of drawing, just a basic artist's view, was very helpful in visualizing the actual action we were asking for. Um, as an example, we'd supply a drawing that would look something like this. This had a kind of a schematic view looking down on the garbage dump and talk about the frame numbers and the number of feet that the object actually traveled in a certain amount of time. The light cycle was a particular problem because it was being done by a facility who used the uh, memory bank shape uh, library kind of uh, image production. In other words, you take set volumes and subtract or add to them. And that produced a problem. The light cycle was a concept in the film which was produced by a command wand that the warriors or the riders carried. And they would grasp this wand like the handlebars and then the bike would materialize around them. The problem was that the image producing system did not, did not accommodate the combination of shapes that I had designed to make the bike look like it looked. Another problem was uh, simply money. Originally we envisioned the riders wearing costumes that had segments like a, much like a lobster, let's say. And when they would crouch over in the seat and match up to the windshield part, their bodies would then become part of the bike. This required much, much more computer animation than they could afford. And that's why the bicycles, the, the light cycles, form, and then in a flash, they go over the rider's head and all becomes an enclosed shape. We knew that there was a lot of computer graphics to do for this film. And uh, it was always intended that we do about 15 or 20 minutes, which was a huge amount. Nobody had ever really undertaken that amount. Yeah, after the initial terror of realizing that we were going to use a medium no one had ever used before, including us, we started to recognize the unique possibilities of working in the computer and the things that it would do for us, that it would free us from camera movement and free us from all kinds of restraints. And it would give us the ability to do something that was almost, that was very difficult to do in 2D, and that is actually go into the scene, to do Z moves, to actually immerse yourself within objects and travel as if you were a point of view. That's something that you couldn't do. Remember, drawings, you can go back and forth and up and down, but you can't go in. So if you look at the stylization of Tron, there are several major conceptual decisions we made. One was that there was no sun in the electronic world. Everything had its own light. It was all made of energy, so the, the world that we designed had a very specific design style based on what we could do with the live action characters, what we could do with the CG, and how we could marry them. Because it's a fantasy world, you can make those rules up. The vehicles, the flying scenes, the moving stuff, the, the light cycles, of course, the whole MCP sequence is all computer generated. The backgrounds, every part of that is CG. There was no Photoshop, there was no manipulating objects like graphics in a two-dimensional way. Uh, the modeling of objects was incredibly complicated and difficult, um, and Magi Synthavision had their way, but it had limits as to what kind of shapes you could create. You couldn't create any shape you could imagine when it had multiple curves. It couldn't, you know, create a spline or, or uh, rotate an object to create a shape. And then the render time for frames was phenomenal. I mean, it was 10 minutes a frame or that type of thing. All right, let's get this show on the road. This was before the world went digital, so we were talking about uh, computers and companies that were one of a kind. Each one had their own hot rod, turbo in its own way. Uh, they had their own software and hardware and, and their own film recorders, and they were diverse. Maybe they shared some algorithms here and there, but, you know, it was uh, on the very beginning edge of, of where that technology was and becoming somewhat dependable. When you went to these places, it was as if one was going into weird occult 
mystical laboratories where people were conjuring up things that the rest of the world felt very uneasy about. It's a hard thing to, to convey to people today what it felt like then. But there was something sort of like, oh my God, you know, it's, these are Frankenstein labs and when these creatures come forth, we're all gonna pay a price. There were four companies that worked on the film, Magi Synthivision, Information International, Robert Abel and Associates, and Digital Effects. The real world, the electronic world transition that was done in the movie, which was done by the Abel Studios, was done by Kenny Merman, and it was a very unique and beautifully designed piece, I thought. That was really complex. That was actually shooting vector graphic computers, making a whole bunch of lines add up to be a shape, putting color filters on the camera, shooting a pass, then putting bipack mats in the camera, shooting another pass, and there are lots of incredible amounts of time and energy put into that, that transition. When you're actually going down that first tunnel, there's like blue static kind of stuff flashing around in there. That's actually static from the bipack mag, and there were so many passes, and so many times, they get, and every time that they tried to do it, they always got this static discharge, but it was there, and uh, there was no way we could really finally get rid of it, so hey, put a sound effect there, you know. The other company that worked on the picture was Digital Effects, a company in New York City that Judson Rosebush had um, put together. They did the Tron logo at the beginning where you see the pieces coming together to form the character, and they also did the bit. Two companies, uh, Magi Synthavision. Synthavision. In New York and Triple I uh, here in Los Angeles. We're going to do the majority of the work. The way the work was divided up between the two companies was that Magi Synthavision did generally the more simple objects because their modeling system put basic geometries together. By adding and subtracting primary shapes, you create an object, and that's how they model. Even though they might look complex on film, they did the light cycles, the recognizers, the tanks. One of the reasons we, we asked Magi Synthavision to do the light cycles specifically is that the design by Sid Mead of the light cycles uh, was such that you could take these basic geometric shapes and slice them and dice them and kind of put them back together again and you came up with a light cycle that was really pretty cool and, and, and pretty incredible and coming off a of design of Sid Mead, it looked bang, it looked exactly like it. Uh, for things that had multi-curves and more complex designs, Information International was far superior on that level because they were making polygonal models where you would literally draw an object out in three views, divide it up into polygons, and encode those images in a... In a uh, the drawings were huge, like this, and there was a big digitizing tablet it was four by six feet, roughly, and uh, so every little point was digitized. So you're making a wire mesh type model rather than solid objects interpenetrating each other. So they had two diverse ways of making models, and Triple I's was much more complex. So Triple I did Sark's Carrier and the Solar Sailor and the MCP and things that had multi curves and shapes. There was one computer at Information International, the computer, not. Like, not like we had multiples, we had one race car. And uh, it was called the Foonly. And the whole thing was this big old hardwired computer that was about as big as uh, four deep freezers put together. You know, roughly 15 feet by, you know, by about eight feet wide. And this thing would uh, glitch. You know, you just never knew when it was gonna glitch. We finally ran preventive maintenance on it all the time. That didn't really assure anything, because really somebody walking into the room that uh, you know had on uh, a fur coat could <laughs> set the thing off. So it was, it was really uh, walking on thin ice with that computer, and it, it was the iris that everything that came out of Triple I had to go through. So if it ever really broke down in some major way, we would have, we would not have made the movie. Triple I had a had a had a very, very tough job. They had to create the Solar Sailor, which we knew what he wanted to look like, but Stephen was insistent that it have translucent uh, sails. And I lobbied somewhat heavily for non-translucent sails. I said, you know, Stephen, we're, we could be sinking ourselves here, excuse the pun, with the Solar Sailor if, if we go with translucent sails. And he said, quite rightly, look, the, the look of it needs to be ethereal, it needs that translucency, it needs to be magical craft. And if it has solid sails, it just doesn't work. It doesn't look as beautiful, it's not as elegant. 
And so he stuck to his guns. And when we saw the creation of the Solar Sailor, which was one of the first things that I did, and as it builds up and you see these wonderful translucent sails, I tell you, there, was, there were a lot of great moments uh, during that year, and that was one of them. And so there was certainly a different look to what the two different companies were going to do, always searching for that consistency. We didn't want it to look like, oh, well, this company did this part of the film and this company did this part of the film. In fact, there are areas in the film right in the middle where the transition takes place where you do see shots that are Magi Synthivision shots and then Triple I shots and then a Magi Synthivision shots. And they all, they all work together very well. So we were very fortunate that despite the two different technologies, we still had a consistency. I was working at the Disney Studios. I was an animator on Mickey's Christmas Carol when Tron was being produced. Two of my friends, Jerry Reese and Bill Croyer, were working on Tron. And they were doing the storyboarding and the choreography, you might say, of the, all the computer animation. They were over in, in one of the trailers, and they had a computer that was hooked via, via phone line back to New York with Magi Synthivision. And my good friend Chris Wedge uh, was back there working on the animation, and he would send over the phone line um, the scenes frame by frame by frame for them to look at some of the early, early renderings. For me, this was some of the very first computer animation I had ever seen, and it was so exciting. The first scene that I remember them working on was the light cycle sequence, and it absolutely blew me away. You had to have a completely symbiotic relationship with the computer technicians. You know, they had never done film, and we had never used computers. You, didn't, you couldn't have all the tools you wanted because you didn't know what tools you would need. It became this process of learning about what the technology could do, and then brainstorming the creative side to use it. There really was no software to make anything move. There was only software to describe where things sat. And if you wanted something to go from here to here, it was literally as simple as, you know, X is four, now X is six, there's two units, and that was that. I mean, there was just nothing else, you know, around. So suddenly, Jerry Reese and I, who were the only animators on the whole show, were faced with the situation of trying to create what we consider to be Disney's quality animation, which meant animation that moved with personality and moved with drama. And we had to do it with no tools. You wouldn't even be able to even pull a wireframe up on the screen and make it move. You couldn't even do that. You could only see a wireframe, a very primitive wireframe, at one frame at a time. And you could ask for frame one and frame 20 and frame 60, and you can kind of see them, but you could never see them move. But what was kind of terrifying about Tron is we would, we would plot out these very complicated moves. We'd have vehicles chasing each other down irregular canyons with cameras flying through the air and twisting and rolling and diving. And all that had to be done with these very simple graphs. We had to go ahead and break it down frame by frame by frame, increment by increment. Because let's say you've got an object, like a light cycle. A light cycle, for every frame that it moves, it will need at least six numbers to describe its position. It will need its x, y, and z translations to show where it is in space. And then it will need its, its yaw, pitch, and roll to describe how it's tilting. So that means for 100 frames, you need 600 numbers of data. 100 frames is four seconds. So you need 600 numbers to describe where it is. Now you can imagine us sitting around writing 600 numbers for four seconds for one thing, right? So what we would do is we would figure out on graph paper, OK, the light cycle is going to start here on frame one. And then three seconds later on frame 72, it's going to be over here. And it's going to travel an S curve. So gee, if I just take frame one, frame 20, frame 60, and frame 72, I'll just take those four frames, I'll run down the hall, I'll plug those into the Oxbury computer thing, I'll hit a button and all these numbers will come up. And then I just sat there with my exposure sheet and I wrote down all 600 numbers on an X sheet. And we gave these guys at the computer company these exposure sheets with six rows of numbers for every single frame. And they went and they hand programmed them in. They typed them in. There was no way to just like download it, you know, you didn't have a floppy disk you could put it on. You just, but that, 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 you typed it. Come on, you scuzzy data, be in there. Come on. And then the very, very first time we would see it move would be in 70 millimeter on the stage. We would go to the sound stage at Disney, and we would stand there in front of a gigantic 70 millimeter screen, and they would reel this film up, 70 millimeter film on a projector, and they'd run it. And that'd be the very first time we'd see it move. That was our pencil test. You look at any PlayStation 2 game or an Xbox game, and the complexity of the visual there is infinitely more complex than Tron. 
uh, and it's on the fly. You know, and in the movie Tron, Flynn is playing a rastrographic game, you know, driving a tank through, and it's all shaded and everything. At that time, that was the games that people were playing were, you know, asteroids and Pong, and they were like 2D. There were. T I can't say off the top of my head that we started by saying we want to do light cycles. I mean, where I think these things came together was out of the idea of a game grid, an arena, where various games could be played. And, and some of that comes from the original Atari games. I mean, not directly, but just we were inspired when we saw these games, Pong and what have you, and there was a game, I believe, called Breakout. We looked at the games that were out there in the world. They inspired us to create this sort of Spartacus-like arena, this gladiatorial arena. And then we, through a series you know, of artists and, and over a period of months, we developed these conceptually. Because they were so graphic back then, the games lent themselves to a sort of artistic interpretation. It's completely different now. I'm working on ideas for Tron 2, and now one looks at the world of video games and they're so realistic, you know? So in some ways, the capability to generate reality, which was supposed to liberate us, has actually in some ways limited us. Tron was a tour de force of technique matched to very difficult methods of bringing that vision off. Technically, you know, it, it was the first movie to use computer graphics extensively. Tron was one of the first films to have more than 20 some minutes computer generated footage. We were not nominated for a special effects Academy Award because basically the Academy thought we cheated when we used computers to do special effects. Things have certainly changed since then. The computer world at that time was very limited. <laughs> We had no computers on the set of Tron, and probably your cell phone has more computing power in it than we had on the whole movie. In fact, the limitation produced a lot of the design, the, the look of the various vehicles. My original idea for the light cycle was to have the rider with a faceplate, and when he got on the bike, the faceplate would match the bike, and he would articulate onto the bike, sort of like a pressure suit and they just couldn't do it. The computing power just didn't exist to render at that level. This Berger and team had to use practical tools to make a world that looked digital. <laughs> 